so anyone else who wants to participate in the conversation about the overarching commission and the one pager that was distributed, um, we'd love to think with you informally about the goals of this process, about how it coordinates. We're, we're fairly confident that we can raise money for a staff person, but everything will depend on our ability to do that. We can't promise in advance. The commissioners would be appointed by a committee of Montpelier Live, the Montpelier Foundation, and the city for efficiency. On the bottom of that sheet, it describes some of the roles and responsibilities that we're looking at, the kinds of expertise that to be involved in connecting and coordinating and convening all different groups to answer some of these core priorities, the commission will need architectural expertise, hydrology, engineering, environmental science, downtown development, fundraising, land use planning, property connecting to property owners, renters, low income individuals, nonprofit management, financing clean energy, development, housing, public health, resilience planning experience, and other pertinent skills. And of course, we're very dedicated to involving young people and looking through the lens of diversity to make sure that we're connecting to the whole of the community and giving voice to people. So you need all of that, diversity, expertise, skilled professionals, leadership, and people with life, life experience that needs to be at the same table. So that's the outline, and we'd be glad to hear your thoughts about, um, and, and would, would it be useful if I went to the, the application process now, or we'll do so at the end. So be glad to hear your thoughts on, on the way this can work. Um, I just think that it should be taken under consideration that a member of the commission be someone with lived experience of this flood. So that whatever other qualifications they might have, that it's very important to have someone on the commission who actually had was impacted by the flood, experienced it in some substantial way. I mean, we all experienced it to some degree, but I think someone who actually lived through it needs to be there. Thank you so much, sir. I was just curious how, uh, when the commission was conceived, when I thought this whole forum was to actually decide and figure out what the commission was and how it was going to operate. Yeah, I think that right. as a group, the sponsoring organizations were hearing the same things over and over about the absence of leadership, the fact that leadership was discoate in the community, that everyone was saying, yeah, right, have another meeting, and it's just going to stick the things on the wall, and who's going to follow up, and is there going to be any staff leadership to do this? There was also a strong sense that this shouldn't be owned by the city. There were some who thought this should be entirely separate from the city, and it would be an advisory group or a political group to push against the city. And as we thought about it, we thought, you want to add up the skills and strength. There's 100 city employees. A lot of them are working on a lot of these issues now. You don't want to disconnect from their knowledge, experience, and the hard work that they're already doing. And, and as outsiders try to duplicate all that, you want to add to it with vision, with connections, with, with leadership from the community, and engagement of community residents to move things forward. So all that was involved. But we also thought we couldn't wait. That, that you know, this process has been really fast. To put this together has been very, very intense to do all of this in a month and a, and a couple of days. And we didn't want to let it just slide. We, we felt like we should start getting organized and start putting a, um, this in. So we've, we've all already started looking for resources to make this happen because we feel like there's a great urgency to follow up on the public feelings. Yes, ma'am. I just want to recall that folks raise their hands. Okay. Thank you, and because Cassandra, thank you for being here. And you know, we gotta thank the bridge for your absolutely sterling coverage of all of this work. It's it's been just it's been wonderful because you've been the cornerstone of knowledge around what's going on, and it, it's just so important. Thank you, Dan.
Yeah, Paul, uh, or the state is kind of the largest. What? Oh, Dan Jones. Hi. Uh, for those, uh, the state is the largest sort of landowner, uh, et cetera, and uh, participant. Are they going to be involved in this, and how, or have, has that been considered yet? Because uh, it seems to me like, in terms of forming this, the, the, they should be a critical component. Yeah, it, it's important to know that this has happened so fast. Um, but we did put in a call to the state, to Buildings and General Services. They're the biggest landowner in downtown Montpelier. They've got a lot of business buildings that are flood impacted parking and parking lots that could absorb water potentially. Um, so, yeah, they're on the radar. We've had a call in to them today. We're setting up an appointment to think about their connection to this. They're, it's possible the state could be a funding partner as well as an instrumental partner in moving things forward. Yes, ma'am. My name is Lawrence Webster. Uh, this is a small procedural suggestion idea. Throughout this whole process, the past month and a half, I've been wondering where's the Regional Planning Commission and why are they not here and why is their voice not loud? They know this stuff already, um, a lot of it, I think, or should, and some of it's in their comp plan. I think the city manager, executive director of Montpelier Alive and president of the Montpelier Foundation are given as founding members, add a representative of the Regional Planning Commission, please. Thank you so much for that. Um, we've, we've connected with them. The executive director of the Regional Planning Commission is here tonight, probably in that conversation about the watershed management. This is what they do plans, right? We need plan political muscle and dollars that actually changes the field and changes the watershed. And, and so it's not just a planner, but we do have planner on the list as someone, and it could be the executive director of the Regional Planning Commission, or it could be someone else that connects directly to them. But the point's very well made. Sir. Uh, my name's Mark. I, I have a concern about the creation of this thing being so closely tied to the existing, the city government and to Montpelier Alive, will this body have the ability to say your, the, bureaucratic, the bureaucratic roadblock to the course of action that we see as needed is not overly sympathized within this and say, sorry, we're going somewhere else because you, you can't provide the solution. I feel like it's very important that the council itself not be beholden to the city to say we have to manage up to the city's expectations or to, in, in the interests of continuing to have a voice and be part of that, to please the city manager or Montpelier Alive or an, any government entity. I feel like it's very important that this group be able to function outside of and independently of any government body. That, that is a, a great observation and it's absolutely the intent of this. The city, would be part of the committee that would select individuals to be on this. There might be one city employee on this. There's not gonna be people who have city votes versus people who have Montpelier Alive. I don't expect Montpelier Foundation or Montpelier Alive, they may have a one person on this commission, but most people are gonna be people through the, throughout the community that apply to be part of it. Um, so there, there will always be a voting majority of people who are completely independent and the it, this group will be independent of the city in terms of its um, decision making and, and the chair and so forth. The, the challenge is that you need to also build unity so you're not just uh, a protest group and that you are using money effectively to drive things forward and connecting to uh, existing resources to move things. So we've tried to find the right balance point and I really appreciate the question because I think that this isn't a done deal yet. It's a deal in process. What we have on paper is our best estimate of what the plan is, but we do want to already, we don't want to wait. We want to start asking people to apply immediately to participate in this process. Yes, state your name, please. Yes, certainly. Hi, I'm Kate McCarthy. Mark, thanks for your point. Um, everybody, thanks for your points. Um, I like the idea of the independence of this group as well as those connections for, sure. For, I like the idea of the independence of the group as well as connections for collaboration purposes. Um, what authority does this group have? Um, it does not, yeah, it does not have authority over the state, 
or, or over you know state funds or over the city. It's a partnership that has the ability to raise big ideas in a way that because of the situation of it following from all this public engagement and because it's got support from Montpelier Alive and the Montpelier Foundation and the city, it's gonna have a loud voice as an advocate beyond Montpelier. It's gonna have the ability to coordinate and invite people together. And any, any number of these groups on the wall could turn into working parts of the commission immediately. So it could engage a lot of residents. There's probably 100 people ready to be involved in this work, right? And so its, its goal is to be an active facilitator of public process to drive this. And everything we hear um, from the city is that they want that, that it's, it's, you know, trying to convene leadership across the watershed is beyond their scope of work and their, their imagination, their, their sense of what they can do. And so this is gonna pick up a lot of things that are beyond, on the other hand, there are existing committees of the, of the city that are doing great work and are going to be probably looking at some of these issues and saying, yeah, we're already doing that or we're, we could be doing that with more volunteers and we'd like to use this as a way to add to the strength and volunteers that are working um, in those processes already. I'm gonna to come to you in first. Okay. <laughs> don't. <laughs> don't touch the mic. Okay. Um, I think what people are talking about is the tricky part. It's what is the, um, what is the relationship to the city and the state and where does this group get to have a voice? And, and because there's not, um, you know, necessarily a, a lot of authority here, but if you can define um, early on where the group and how the group gets to have a voice with the city and the, the city council and, and maybe with state committees, that would be really helpful. I also just wanted to put a plug in, not to try to have so broadly representative a group that it becomes another advocacy group, a mini legislature. I really like small, smaller committees like this with the idea that people are thinking strategically and not just representing something. I mean, I appreciate Andrea's point about having um, people with lived experience on it, but I wouldn't want it to appoint people in a way that it became an advocacy group. We know, and we don't want to build a 28 or 30 person commission. And, and there may be ma many people who can s serve multiple roles, who have resilience expertise and they're an architect and their house was flooded. So <laughs> th there's gonna be ways to, to look at this in aggregate, uh, but we don't know who's gonna wanna be engaged in it. So we'll, we'll see. But I think all these points around its governance and how it has voice, I think right now there's a sort of seamless interconnection between this process and the city. Everyone in the city government is listening. They're, they're dedicated to hearing from citizens right now. And this is really a strong step. And this is a structure that can continue that. Does, it, does an external authority established by the three of us have any power over our elected officials? No. You know, we elect officials who represent us legally. This is an entity that doesn't have power to tell city council what to do. On the other hand, city council is looking for advice and guidance to think big about the future. And this would be a, a tremendously valuable foil to set some of those directions and, and build big ideas like you were describing that can have transformational impact. You notice that things like closing this school didn't end up pr being prioritized at the state house or, or moving the downtown up the hill didn't get prioritized in the last sessions. And I don't think it was because people were saying, none of that is useful. I think it was because people were saying, let's establish structural ways to move the ball that will be in a situation to evaluate those big opportunities and, and be a driver for them, rather than just have a big plan that doesn't go anywhere. And this is all about, at least to my mind and, and I think to the organizers, it's about driving. Uh, it's, not, it's not just an advisory group, it's a group to drive. Dan. Okay. Um, I think my worry was too big and too cumbersome, echoing what Stephanie said. Um, and I don't know if you've got any models in mind of places that have done this. The thing that came to my mind, and I don't know if it's relevant, but there was a whole group put together in the medical establishment during COVID. 
and they had a, a tripartite leadership and they had links to all these various institutions and so on. And I, th I think of a sort of hub and spoke idea with this so that you could get expertise, but you didn't have to have a commission of 40 people. I think that would be... Um, I think that's very wise. And I think as we think about these groups, the potential for the formation of, of leadership teams in different aspects of this. But that there might have to be at least one or two do you have a, do you have a recommendation for the number of commissioners? Somewhere between 12 and 18. Between 12 and 18. Lower. Lower. <laughs> we, we've been thinking maybe 15, but that may, and some people think that's high, so. Well, good. One of the things I've noticed from a number of friends who live in surrounding towns is this sense that Montpelier is the downtown for central Vermont, that we don't have, a, you know, the Regional Com uh, Planning Commission is one focus, but it is kind of diffuse and bureaucratic. And I, I, I don't have a specific uh, proposal here, but rather I think there has to be a way of having the voice of our surrounding communities involved in this, because I think they are part of our decision system, they're going to be part of our support system, and they're going to be part of what's influenced by the whole thing. I think that's a, a wise, I mean, just... I'm a facilitator, so I shouldn't say that's a wise thing to say. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, usually when we've done community processes, anyone who cares about that community, who goes to school there, who's a teacher there, or who um, is in the next town and that's their downtown, anyone who has a psychological identification and wants to help, why would you turn them away from being on a committee to support resilience in this community? So I, I think it's inclusive that way. Kate, and then we'll go to... Um, I know this isn't a, an official city committee, but I'm wondering, um, we implemented something in the last year or so that provides stipends to folks who serve on committees in case they need to pay for childcare, and it's just a, um, I'm wondering if that could be extended to this commission just as an equity thing that would help encourage folks to apply that might otherwise be able to afford it. It's a great idea, and it's one that we're thinking about that people have brought to the table. And right now we don't have a dollar. Every dollar that was raised by Montpelier Foundation, Montpelier Alive, has been pledged that we wouldn't, weren't gonna keep anything for our own um, expenses in doing this work. We're gonna pour it all out through. So it, it will require us to raise a, a fair amount of money. That, and as we do it, you'll see in the sheet, we're thinking, you know, we don't wanna build something that has to be perpetuated forever it has to demonstrate its value to be perpetuated. And so we're gonna do an evaluation after two years. And we would be looking to find funding for it for two years. But I think it's very much on the table. And probably we need to decide that early rather than late. Announce the, yeah. the call for good, good thought. So I just wanted to share some of the um, conversation that's happening from the Zoom. Um, so uh, one person said we need to regain our confidence in Montpelier leadership. Another said we need to have a way for community members to invest in the resilience effort like bonds. Many of us are retired and can't give away our money but might be willing to lend it. Um, someone noted this group sounds like an advisory group. Someone noted folks from Wat Waterbury spoke at the last meeting. They had a very effective track record in moving forward an ambitious agenda over a 10 year period based on community commitment to preventing another Irene disaster. This seems similar. Uh, someone asked, how, do, how does a committee like this drive when it doesn't have the oomph to do it? And uh, another one, where will the force come from to move our thoughts forward? Many times ideas go to the city and die. How do we prevent this? And uh, someone called for new council members and somebody else said, uh, major changes require state and or federal money, um, which people agreed with. And there was a call for student youth members of the commission. Well, some great, great thoughts and great contributions to this dialogue. Thank you. Um, you, sir, and then Kate. So what I, what I think I would like to see out of this is, of course, coordination and cooperation with the city. Also the ability to say, once the city's um, ability has been exhausted, to be able to go to the state or the federal or any number of these ideas, it seems, is a subset of this committee, right? Whether it's raising funds at the federal or, or um, philanthropic level, whether it is coordinating efforts. I've, I've poked my head into maybe a half a dozen or more 
small groups that are trying to do something, and they all have one thing in common, which is everyone has heard of some other small group trying to do something, and it's a diluted sort of energy of a lot of people who have a lot of willingness and a lot of intelligence and passion about it, but it's uncoordinated. Um, I forgot my other point, so. Yeah, it's a great perspective that as a convening center for the future of Montpelier, it can convene and support any number of these groups. I mean, one thing that someone said, Montpelier is the place where good ideas go to die. You know, it's because we, we, we organize in opposition to each other around ideas and we start to split them off. And this is a way to have a convening entity that pays attention and provides mutual support between different groups that are working on this long-term recovery and, and the resilience agenda and, and drives for results, pushes the city, pushes, uh, pushes its, its committees and, and also raises funds to have some resources to help move pieces of it forward. Kate, did you have your hand up? And then I'll go to you, Lauren, and then you, sir. Thanks, Paul. Kate McCarthy. Um, I'm curious, Paul, what do you think, I wrote it down, um, what do you think is the best way for a group like this to maintain its focus and avoid mission creep? By definition, a convener is going to be broad, it's going to be plugged into a lot of different topics and people and ideas and help to bring those together. Um, the risk of the flip side of that can be inaction or mission creep. So based on what you've seen, what do you think? You know, when I've built like 15 policy councils and I've run processes like this in communities all across the state, the first answer is it's all about leadership. And it's the same question about how do you drive the agenda in a consistent way? It's like you need to have a really vigorous, clear chair that facilitates and pulls people together with very different ideas but finds the common ground and common direction and helps them be effective. And that's going to be essential. And then a really strong membership of strong-willed, um, sharp people who want to drive change. And every seat's going to be super important on this, on this working group. Um, but beyond that, I think you have to convene and pay attention to the needs of people. And you have to keep an, a laser-like focus that you're, you know, just as this ending hunger, which is really crucial to us and we care about, that we we keep to the parts that are going to drive recovery and resilience in a consistent way. And I think people understand that. And I think you can test ideas and go back to the people to renew yourself regularly. So, so this is more of an ask. A Andrea alluded to it earlier that this is a huge lift and nobody can do it by himself. So before everybody goes, ask for a show of hands who's willing to put time in and help with this. Right now, we are, we, we've we're putting out to put in an application. So you- Just for volunteers. No, to be members of the commission. Yeah. We're, we're going to have this process. I think that we're gonna need volunteers for all of this stuff. Right. My problem is I'm like, I'm a volunteer and I'm not gonna do it. I know, I'm not gonna to continue to coordinate this. There needs to be an executive director that drives this work and there needs to be a commission. Right now I'm making a lot, too many decisions about what's the next agenda, how does this work. It's gotta be led by a determined group of people who are thinking together in a diligent way regularly. It can't be done by an individual. And so this takes it to that other level and a level where you hire an executive director. It, and that should happen very, very quickly. We, you know, we're, we're really interested in that. To that point, I would say that makes it more important to me that the makeup of the commission be more focused on representing the community. I know there's a need for expertise and, and all that stuff, but somehow people have to be vetted based on their ability to provide a perspective for different parts of the community because we know that the experiences of the flood have been really different. Yeah, Sorry, I thought it was loud enough. <laughs> um, no, that, that we need, just like I said, it needs to be someone who's lived, got lived experience with this flood. We also need people who have lived experience with the different aspects of the community if the expectation is to come up with something that the community is gonna get behind. Thank you.
I, I think that goes from the commission to the committees and task forces that may form around all of this. Right, so, very much what that commission looks like. Yeah. If people see themselves in the commission, I think they will be more bought into whatever the commission comes up with. Jackie Dagger. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree agree with that, being able to represent lived experience. I think when I'm reading about this group and listening to all of the great comments here, I'm thinking about the value of bringing together a group like this with these different experiences and what that could lend to the city and other decision makers. And in my mind, like having these different perspectives together in this group is an opportunity to think about you know, where things might be, um, where timelines might be conflicting, where we, prioritization is important, because this is a, like the things we we're talking about here, they're all gonna have competing timelines. And with experience like this from these different experts, that's really valuable in helping um, prioritize certain actions or even um, convening groups to educate this commission about you know, the issues. And it seems that one of the outcomes of something like that could be recommendations on how to approach some of these um, larger projects. And that could be a great way for this group to work with the city and other um, decision makers. Great, thank you. Yes. I'm definitely, oh you, um, I'm definitely want to be sure that the the feelings and, and experiences of the city are represented. But I see this group as a steering committee. When I think of a commission, I think of a lot of people sitting and listening, but not necessarily being in a position to start implementing. And to me, people in, the, in this group are gonna need to have some ability to either do it or influence it getting done and, and, and recruiting people to flesh out whatever is starting to emerge as important priorities. And, um, and not just make recommendations to who. You know, those recommendations need to be things that they begin to say, yeah, this could work. How do we, how do we test the waters so that we're not missing something that's important to some part of the city? I totally get with that, but I, you know, this idea that they're alone gonna sit on the mountaintop and try to figure this all out themselves or something. I think we, we need to think of them as, as active doers and coordinators and schedulers and a kind of a little less lofty yeah. kind of a vision. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, we'll, go to, we'll go online and then we'll go to you. And then we're gonna need to wrap up pretty yeah. soon. Uh, so a couple additional online comments. Um, one person noted this group needs to be driven with a passion of an effort to preserve our town in the midst of climate change. It can't get lost in process. And when there are roadblocks, it needs to be able to re-raise the critical goal. It isn't about official authority to get things done. It's about the collective commitment to achieve important things. Um, someone's already asking how to apply, which I think you're gonna talk about at the end, and that's exciting. Um, have the document to post as well? Yes, because I can. Because you should post it, and it will show them how to apply at the bottom of it. Great. And there'll also be press release going out today or tomorrow, tonight or tomorrow morning. Perfect. Um, so it'll be posted and press release. Um, decisions will be made by individual commercial property owners, business owners, and homeowners. Decisions are being made now, underscoring the urgency. Um, and I, I was just going to note, too, I mean, we've talked a lot about kind of limitations of the city or hope, how does this group push the city? And I just want to note, like, I hope this group is thinking beyond the city. The city government does certain things. The state does some things. Nonprofits in our community do something. So I would hope it would come in with a much more broad vision, which I think is what's reflected on the wall, yeah. and look at what, what does the city do well, and then what needs to not be the city or needs to be a partnership of the city and other actors. Thank you. So if, um, if I'd like to tag on to the idea of the doers and just share a little bit about how management works at where I work, all of our so-called middle management is volunteer, is volunteer force. No one is paid for those positions, no one really has bosses, but what we do have is a regional leader and then below that person there are leaders that cover specific areas. In the case of business, it's things like growth and performance, diversity, equity, inclusion, et cetera. 
Um, and then each of those leaders is free to form their own team to make sure that many voices is heard and then that leader comes back to the group. So it keeps the main group somewhat lean and small. I think there are about five or six of us, but the entire leadership team is somewhat large. There are maybe 30 or 40 people, but it doesn't get bogged down. And then each one of those leaders is tasked with either their task for, the, for that week, month, whatever it is, or delegating that task to someone else on their team, whether that be the, the watershed person or the raising money person or the shouting upstream at the state and federal government person, et cetera, they have deliverables that is their responsibility to deliver. Um, we, we have to close up. And hey, Ben, Ben, can you run down and tell everyone to come back? Thanks. Not two minutes, 30 seconds. As you can anticipate, I'm a little disappointed about the results. You could have anticipated those five two weeks ago, even before you wrote them. Um, it's coming up. There's nothing exciting here. There's nothing that's going to engage anybody. Not because it's because they're not out there, because there's no room in this process for those kinds of ideas. We need to find a way to get those ideas into this process. I suspect that, that people will bring these ideas into these committees and things will be driven forward. So I'm optimistic, but thanks so much. Um, Sarah, is everybody coming back in? Oh, okay, we're going to shift in just a second here and start talking about points of vision, but we also want to hear from our facilitators, so we got to move fast. 